And we'll turn now to the word of the Lord. We'll be looking at 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, as we continue to make our way through the book of Kings, and here specifically in the ministry of Elisha, before we read, let's pray together. Pray God, we know and love your word, and we know that not one word goes out without accomplishing what you have sent it for, and so we pray asking and trusting that you will keep that promise yet one more time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Kings 6, 1-7 The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied. And he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried, it was borrowed. The man of God asked, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it down there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. And the man reached out his hand and took it. Before we get too deeply into this text, I wanted to go back just a little bit into last week's text and the account of, of Naaman the Syrian being cleansed. And, and there we had, we had looked at the cleansing of Naaman the Syrian, but I, I had a number of follow-up questions that given to me, and the, the main one given to me was, well, who was the king? See, last week we saw that the, the king of Syria sends Naaman off to the king of Israel, and he says to the king of Israel, I want you to heal this man. <clears throat> the king of Israel tears his robes, and he, he says, I, I can't heal this man. I don't have the power of life and death, and he has no faith. If he had had faith, he'd sent him off to Elisha. But the question is, well, who was the king who tore his robes? And the answer is, well, we don't know. Our best guess is that it was Jehoram or Joram. That might get confusing, but we have things like this. So we might say your name is Timothy, but we call you Tim. Well, Jehoram and Joram, it's the, it's the same name. Uh, that's our best guess. You might say, well, why are we guessing? Why can't we know? And the, the thought there is, is that we think generally in very linear terms. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And that's generally the way that kings works, isn't it? We, we start with the reign of Solomon and the death of David, and we work our way forward in time until the Jews go into exile off to Babylon. But there are some times where things in the Scriptures aren't recorded primarily chronologically. And the reason for that is that in Scripture, theology always trumps chronology. The point the author wants to make is more important than always keeping the stories in their order. And so we can, we can look at that in this instance. It's good for us to know that the ministry of Elisha the prophet overlaps with four different kings of Israel. And yet as we look at all these miracles of Elisha as they're recorded, the king of Israel is never named in any of them. And why is that? Because the king isn't important. The focus isn't on the king of Israel. The focus on, is on what is God doing. If you look at the, if you look at the stories, they fit into a, a very nice pattern. It starts with Elisha and the Lord caring for the poor. And then it goes up one step, and Elisha and the Lord care for the prophets sort of like the, the pastors of the day. And then at the very heart of the story, the Lord cares for Naaman, the pagan, proud Gentile. And then we see as we come today, one step down, we come back to the prophets again. And then as we go to the end, we see that just as the Lord is sovereign over the small things like the poor, so in the next story we see that he is sovereign over over the great grand things, like delivering his people from great enemies. And what stands at the very heart of it all? 
But Naaman stands at the very heart of it all. And it shows us that even as the average Israelite would have seen and would have appeared to them as if the whole world around them was falling apart, and even as it would have seemed like God was up to nothing, as if God was absent in the time, the author of Kings reminds us that even when we can't see it, and even when it doesn't seem as though it's so, God is always, always, always at work. And so that brings us into the passage we have today. We come off the high, so to speak, of Naaman, and now we come back to these prophets, the the persecuted preachers of Jesus' day. These these are not the miracle-working prophets. These are are not the future-telling prophets. These are just the ordinary preachers of the day who would preach a, a forbidden message in hostile territory among the people of Israel under the reign of of pagan, God-hating kings even of Israel. And so we come, and the story before us is, is a rather small thing. It's, it's an axe head which floats. That might seem like a, a fairly large thing for us, and no doubt we would like to see such a thing, but, but this isn't that big of a thing in the grand scope of the Scriptures. This isn't the, the conversion and the healing of, of leprosy of this this big, powerful army general from a, from a foreign land. And this isn't the, the raising of the dead that we have seen elsewhere in the book of Kings. This is just simply the floating of an axe head from a regular Joshmo prophet of the day. It seems so little in comparison. But if you were to, if you were to read through the literature covering just these short seven verses, you would probably be, as as I have been, you would be surprised at how many times the miracle is explained away. And scholar after scholar will say, well, you know what Elisha really did is he he took a stick and he kind of scooted the axe head closer to the shore so that it could be grabbed. Or he took the stick and he he stuck it just so and very subtly in the the hole of the axe head and lifted it to the top of the water so that it seemed as though it had floated. Well, that would have been nice of him, wouldn't it? But that's not what happened. And that's not what the Scripture says. And the same thing goes for other miracles as well. Take, for instance, the feeding of the the 5,000. Now, some scholars will say, well, what really happened is that there was this young boy and he was, he was full of faith and he was full of generosity and seeing all these people who didn't have food. He comes to Jesus and he says, well, I have these loaves and these fish and I'm willing to share. And all the rest of the guys who had food hiding in their pockets or in their bags and were hogging it for themselves said, well, boy, I want to be more like that boy. And so they got out their bread and pretty soon there was enough food for everyone. And, and wouldn't that be sweet? That's not what the Scripture says, is it? The little boy didn't lead them by example. Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish to feed the whole crowd. You know, it's a very sinister thing when someone would claim the name of Christian for themselves and then deny very basic truths of the Christian faith. But this points us to a very simple reality which is good for us to keep in mind. The theological li- liberalism which might call itself Christianity is not Christianity. It's like J. Gresham Machen said a hundred years ago, liberalism and Christianity are two different religions. And we can see that in a story like this. The religion that says Elisha scooted the axe head towards the shore is very different from the religion that says God made the axe head float. One refuses to accept the supernatural, and one embraces the supernatural as the work of God. And isn't it a small thing? An axe head. right? We believe that God created everything out of nothing. We believe that God took on the form of a man in the person of Jesus. We believe that God can raise the dead. What is a floating axe head compared to the raising of the dead. It's a small thing, isn't it? And if we believe the first and the last, there's no reason we ought not to believe this. It's a small thing. So that begs the question, why does God care about the axe head? Why does God care? If God is the God who 
causes empires and kingdoms to rise and fall. And if God is the God who raises the dead and makes, makes all things out of nothing, if God is the God who will one day make everything new and bring creation back to a state of perfection, why does God care about small things like axe heads? Isn't He too big for that? Doesn't He have better things to do? Aren't there bigger fish to fry, so to speak? And one might think that but you would be wrong to think that. God does care about little things because God cares about little people. And we see that as we begin here in verses 1 and 2. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, Go. See, the company of the prophets, they have a good problem to have. Their number has grown. As the church oftentimes grows in, in persecution, so the church is growing in the time of the kings. And now there, there are too many of these company of the prophets, there are too many of these preachers that when they all get together to learn from the master prophet Elisha about what they should be preaching and what the Lord has said, they're, they're too crammed in the space they've been using and so they suggest very simply, well, let's go build a bigger place. Let's go build a, a bigger seminary, so to speak. And so Elisha says, go. Go build the, the bigger seminary. And it says that this is a place to live. But, but what really that is, it's more like a dorm. Because the prophets had their own families. They had their own places where they lived. They had their own jobs and fields and all that sort of thing. But this was a place where when they came together, for, for their lesson time with Elisha, they would live until they were sent back to their homes and to their ministries. And so they decided to go down by the Jordan River and they build a bigger place for them to live. And then as we move into the next verse and a half, we see that one of the brothers has an idea. Wouldn't it be nice if Elisha came with us? He could be an encouragement to the group as we build. And so we see that he does verses 3 and the first half of verse 4 then one of them said won't you please come with your servants I will Elisha replied and he went with them maybe Elisha thought it could be an encouragement whatever it may be he decides that he's going to go with the crew as they build as they build this new place for them to learn and to stay and the problem presents itself in the first part of verse 5 we read there, as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Seems like a small thing, doesn't it? An axe head. This is the kind of thing where if it happened to one of us, it would, it would just mostly be an annoyance. If I, if I dropped my axe head in the water, it would mean that I would have to go off to Gus Bach and go buy a new axe to keep going at my work, right? It might cost me an hour of my time, but it's, it's not going to be a, a crippling situation. And, and, you know, the guy says, well, it was borrowed, right? That might be embarrassing. You, you, you ruined something that belonged to somebody else. I remember when we, when we were moving into the house here in Lansing, Holly was there, thank you Holly, Holly was there doing some, some landscape cleanup for us and the, the dustpan was left on the driveway and I backed the van over it and it broke, right? It wasn't that it was the dustpan broken, but it was that it was, it was borrowed and it was, but it was really no big deal, right? You go to the store, you get a replacement, you give it, you give it back, right? It, it, was, it was no big deal, but for this man, this accident is a big deal. You ever think about this? If I speed and I get a ticket, which I do not do, but if I speed and I get a, a ticket, the ticket, the ticket might be $150. If someone, if someone making 10 times as much as I do speeds and gets a ticket, the ticket is $150. If someone making 10% of what I make speeds and gets a ticket, the ticket is for $150. Now, for me, the $150 might sting, right? Maybe I can't go to the Cubs game, which would be a big bummer lately, right? For the person who makes significantly more, it might not even be something that's remembered a week later. But for the person who makes next to nothing, that might be make or break. For them, 
It might not be not going to the Cubs game or not getting the nails done or the, the hair done. For them, it might not be paying rent. Maybe it's not being able to put food on the table that week. You see, different things have different values to different people. For us, the axe head might seem like nothing. For this man, the axe head seemed like it was everything. So how can this matter, though? How can this matter to the God who causes empires to rise and fall? Who raises the dead? Who spends time with kings? How can this matter to him, the God of all creation? Wasn't well, it true that he causes kingdoms to rise and fall? It's true. But isn't it also true that his eye is on the sparrow? And isn't it also true, as the Catechism said, that he knows the number of the hairs on my head? And isn't it true that the one who was raised from the dead also walked with fishermen and sat down to talk with a Samaritan serial adulteress at a well? And isn't it true that that same one said that even something so simple as giving a cup of cold water in his name is worthy of eternal reward? He is the God of the big things, yes. But he is also God of the small things. Small things like axe heads. It's as if the Holy Spirit put this story here for a reason, isn't it? It's not just the words of the story, but it's the location of the story. You have big, great, powerful Naaman on one side, and you have the, the freeing of an entire country from a besieging army on the other. You have these two great things of international significance. But right in the middle is average Joe Schmo with an axe head that falls in the water. And it's as if the Lord is saying to us, yes, I can heal lepers, and yes, I can make armies fail, but don't forget that I care about the little guy too. And isn't that something that you and I need to hear? Some of us might be bigger guys than others, but we're all little guys. None of us is the commander of a great army or a king. We're little guys. But right here in 2 Kings 6, verses 1 to 7, God says very plainly, I care about the little guys. And I care about the big things for the little guys. And look again at the second part of verse 5 there. The man says, Oh my Lord, he cried out. It, it, was, it was borrowed. Now the, the borrowed, he doesn't have the means to pay it back. Iron is, is rather expensive and he lives in the time of a famine when things are, are very expensive. There, this is not a time of plenty and, and he's a, a persecuted preacher. He's the kind of guy who has to go off to a, to a hidden house by the river to be able to learn the word of the Lord from the, the prophet. This is, not a man of, this is not a man of great means. And so he, he proclaims to the prophet, that, I, I, I need help. I need help. You see, the, the margin for error is very, very small here. I remember my, my first year, my second year maybe it was in ministry. It was so hot and so dry that I accidentally set my front yard on fire. And I watched in horror as the fire went closer and closer and closer to the telephone pole that was in my front yard. And my first thought was, what are they going to say when I have burned the parsonage grass and the telephone pole is in flames? But as you would drive down, as you would drive down the highway, you would see fields full of dead crops. Everything was dead. In fact, everything was so dead that many of the farmers didn't even go out to harvest what had been planted. The cost of the gas would have been greater than the profit off the crops. But you see, today they have insurance for that kind of thing. Nobody had to sell the farm because there's more margin for error. 
But two generations ago, that kind of a harvest would have caused men to have to sell the farm and move. Not very much margin for error. And for this man, there's not much margin for error. So now what? The borrowed axe head is at the bottom of the murky river. There's really no chance of recovering it. Now what will he do? Well, he turns and he says, Oh, my Lord, and he's not taking the Lord's name in vain. He's, he's speaking to Elisha the prophet. Oh, oh, Master, the axe head, and it was borrowed. There, there's no place for him to turn any longer. It can remind us of the, of the X-Lax soup, the, the death soup, where the, the guys ate it and they immediately realized that it's poison. And what did they do? But they, but they turned to the prophet and they say, Oh, man of God, there's death in the pot. And what they're saying is the same thing that this guy's saying. And he might very well have been there for the death soup as well. They're saying the same thing. We can't help ourselves. We need you, oh man of God. God, we need you to help us. He turns. He turns not to the guy who says, you just need to think positively. Everything's going to be okay. He doesn't turn to the guy who says, you know, we're, we're going to be able to figure something out. He doesn't turn to the guy who says, well, if you'd have had more faith, that wouldn't have happened. Next time, put the 50 bucks in the pre-addressed envelope and send it, and this kind of thing won't happen to you again. But who does he turn to? He turns to the man of God who has the power of of God and he trusts him and what good luck the man of God is right there right what good luck here Elisha just so happens to be here oh oh man this is this is wonderful but it's not luck is it you see God is here all along right it doesn't tell us that God spoke through the voice of the prophet the unnamed prophet who said won't you come with us but can't you see God, the, the master chess player of the universe, moving all the pieces into just the right place at just the right time so that when the man's axe head falls off, the prophet is there and the prophet is ready at just the right time in just the right place to bail out this humble, faithful prophet who has lost the axe head that he could not afford to replace. It reminds me of the story of Edwin C. Hall. He was a, a soldier in the Civil War, a Union soldier. And one day they went out for battle, as soldiers do in war, and Edwin was struck in the chest with a Confederate bullet. But the bullet didn't go into his chest. The bullet stopped short of his chest. And why? Because that morning Edwin had put his Bible in his front pocket. And the bullet struck the Bible, and the Bible stopped the bullet and prevented it from getting into his chest. In fact, you can still see the bullet in the Bible in the right place if you go find it. But you know, I don't think that Edwin woke up that morning and when he was done with his devotions, put it in there and said, I'm putting on the armor of God today, and this, this is going to save my life. I think that he probably put that in his pocket like he had done any number of days before, and just thought, well, I'm just going to put it here. I've got to grab my musket. I've got to go off to war. Grab my rifle. I've got to go off to war. I'm going to go fight a battle. But the Lord knew what was going to happen to him that day. The Lord is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over big guys like Naaman and big kings. And He's also sovereign over the little guy, working all the details of life out for the good of His people. For those who love Him and are called according to to his purpose. And so by God's gracious providence, here the right man is at the right time, and Elisha is the right man. Uh, one scholar, Paul Howe, said Elisha's miraculous powers help him to be the perfect master in these crisis situations. Elisha is exactly the man that this no-name prophet needs. What about us? What about little guys in 21st century Lansing? There's no Elisha. Elisha's been dead and buried for over 2,500 years. There's no one to make axe heads float or put together dustpans miraculously on the driveway. There's no one to call down rain in a drought 
Elisha's gone. What will we do? We see the, the power didn't belong to Elisha in the first place, did it? Elisha wasn't great from birth. Nothing inherent in Elisha himself that was so powerful or magnificent. Elisha was great because the great God was with him. Elisha's power did not come from inside. Elisha's power came from the outside. Elisha's power came from Elisha's God. The people turned to Elisha not because he was Elisha. The people turned to Elisha because he was God's man. And today we do not need to summon a reincarnation of Elisha. Today instead we call upon not only God's man, but we call upon the God-man. We call upon Christ, who was a prophet incredibly more powerful and greater even than Elisha. Who cares for the little guy today? Who cares for everyday, ordinary, Joe Schmo Christian? Well, Christ does. And we are the little guy, aren't we? Today's Mother's Day. And when you think about everyday, ordinary, regular persons, this is no slight, you know that. But mothers fit the bill, don't they? Mothers have what appears from the outside and all too often from the inside to have menial jobs. You change diapers. You know, the thing about changing diapers is you've got to change it again in just a couple hours. Right? You feed mouths. And then you pick up the spit up 30 minutes later from the same mouth. And you vacuum rugs. And then you clean up toys. And then you get drooled on. And you get spit on. You get attitude. You give spanks. And then you go to bed tired just to wake up and do it again the next day. But you don't get to just wake up and do it again the next day. You've got to wake up two or three times before you wake up to do it again the next day. And you do it again and again and again and again. And all the while, the world cares less and less about the average ordinary mom. So the world cares less and less. But does God care? Does God care about you, O wiper of backsides? Does he care about you, O feeder of mouths? Does he care about you, O vacuumer of carpets? Does he, does he care about you, O wiper of spit? Does he care about you, O, o driver of minivans? And O, o helper of homeworks? Does he care about you who goes to bed and wakes up and goes to bed and wakes up and goes to bed and wakes up all the while your husband might be sleeping all the way through? Don't resent him. Don't resent him. But does he care about you, mom? Every day, ordinary, Jane Doe, Christian mom, does he care about you? He does, doesn't he? If he cares about the no-name prophet with the axe head in the water, he cares about the little guy. And he cares about the little woman. And isn't that the, isn't that the great glory of our God? That he can care about the great big things. And he can cause empires to rise and empires to fall. And he can feed thousands of Israelites day by day by day by day with miracle bread on the ground of the wilderness. And he can raise the dead. And he can make all things new. He can do the, the great, grand, glorious things which he does. And he can at the same time have his eye on the sparrow, know the number of heads, uh, number of hairs on your head, and know how many diapers you have changed, know how tired you are, and how little sleep you are, and care. And he can do the great things and the small things without neglecting the one in favor of the other. And that's what this story is getting at. It's not so much about the axe head or about the prophet. If it was about the little prophet, he would have had his name given. It's not about the prophet. It's not about the axe head. It's about the God. 
The God cares. The God cares about Gentiles, praise the Lord, who need to be saved. The Lord cares about kingdoms and empires and His kingdom and His people, praise the Lord. But the Lord also cares about the individual, everyday little man. And why? Because it's his everyday, ordinary, little man. This prophet was his prophet. And you, who belong to Christ, you are his little guy. And there is more dignity in being God's little guy than there is in being the greatest man in the world who does not belong to Christ. Let's pray. O oh God, who hangs stars in skies who puts kings on thrones and tears kings off of thrones, who feeds the thousands, raises the dead, who makes all things new. We praise you that you are not the watchmaker God who sets things off and lets them go without care or concern. We praise you that you are not a powerless, moralistic God who only makes it appear as though you have the power to feed the thousands or make the axe head float. But we praise you that you are the God of our Lord Jesus Christ who cared for tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes who cared for fishermen, who cared for women and children. We thank you that you are, that you are the one who cares. Even for those like us, whose lives are like grass, which grows and withers, or like a mist. We thank you that you are the God of the little guy. That your son was crucified, dead, buried, raised, and glorified. So that every day, ordinary people like those prophets and like us might live as kings and queens and princes and princesses in the great glory of your kingdom, one day receiving back once more the full honor of what it means to bear your image in perfection and in wholeness. We praise you today that you care for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.